Well, welcome to John. Um, thanks very much for coming over. <laughs> and, um, it's going to be a modelling talk this time, so it's the second of three talks in Melbourne. Um, yesterday's was fascinating, and um, we have a lot of questions for that one. This is a, we've gone from ethics, um, now really focusing more on optimization modelling, and then next week's talk will be actually on optimization algorithms. So we've got three different topics. Tremendous breadth. Anyway, it's great to have you here, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, so this is a talk about modelling. And given the modeling expertise in the room, I'm very curious to hear your reactions, positive or negative, to this. This is very much research in progress. So uh, you know, I'm looking forward to your feedback. It's a joint work with uh, a former student, Alice Yunus, and Andre Sire, who is just now graduating. He was actually here at Monash some years ago as a, as a student, uh, a visiting student. Okay, so uh, the issue here is how to exploit problem structure when you model an optimization problem. And I'm using the premise that you can't solve a combinatorial problem without exploiting problem structure. Right? So we have the we have the, the no prelets theorem, basically, right? So, so you know, basically, all algorithms are the same unless you exploit the specific problem structure in some way. That's called the full employment theory. Uh, it, it keeps us busy exploiting problem structure. You know, otherwise, we would be out of the job. All right. So, uh, how is this done? You know, so if you're, if you're using a SAT solver, you have to find the right SAT encoding okay, to make it work. You know, get a reasonable solution. If you're using a MIPS solver, uh, well, again, you have to be very careful about the formulation of the problem, and then the right variables, the right inequalities. Uh, you have to usually have to add valid inequalities, set the parameters correctly on the solver. People have pointed out that using a MIP solver is itself an empty card problem to set the parameters correctly, right? uh, and so forth. Okay. So somehow we want to convey the problem structure to the solver. Solver can take advantage of it. It has to do this one way or another, or it's not going to solve the problem. So why not use a modeling approach that does this in a principled and systematic way? Okay. So what we'd like to do is uh, use a modeling approach that can, such that the model can be processed somehow, so as to uh, convert to the right formulation for the solver you choose. So it's the very familiar problem to you guys in the G12 system and so forth. That's the problem we're looking at as well. Um, when you do this, however, uh, it poses a fundamental problem of variable management. This is a problem that we encountered when developing our integrated solvers called SIMPLE, S-I-M-P-L. And uh, it was a constant nuisance to us, so we decided to look at this in a more systematic way because I think it's a general problem, and I'll try to explain what I'm talking about. Uh, the problem is, if you have a number of constraints in your model, and I'm thinking on the level of high-level constraints, or global constraints, what we call meta-constraints, constraints that uh, incorporate a number of more elementary constraints. Uh, when these constraints are transformed into a, a model that's appropriate to the solver, usually you introduce new variables, auxiliary variables of some kind, maybe zero, one variables, who knows. Two different constraints may introduce variables that are actually the same variable or related in some other way. Okay, that's the issue. How does the solver know that the variables introduced by this constraint, when you process it, are really the same or related to the variables introduced by this other constraint? You have to know that, particularly if you want to formulate a relaxation of the problem, which is some important in optimization. And uh, the relaxation will be too weak unless you can identify or relate these variables that are so closely related. I'll give you lots of examples of this. So what we're going to try to do is to address this problem in a general way using a typing strategy, semantic typing. Okay, so just to give you a preview, 
Uh, semantic typing is a way of uh, associating each variable with a different predicate and a keyword. Okay. So the model is going to be organized around predicates, multiplex predicates. And when we declare a variable, we're going to do it by querying, in some sense, the relation denoted by that predicate. Something like a database query. So this will allow us to deduce relationships between variables, not only variables in the original model, but variables that are that are created to convert the constraints into solver form. And we think it's good modeling practice as well. It documents the model, it's a self-documenting model. So there's some examples. You know, suppose you have uh, if a variable in your model, it looks like this, an integer variable. And for solution purposes, you want to disaggregate it into 0, 1 variables. So you get some kind of connection like this. It's done all the time. Okay. Well, you may have another constraint that disaggregates a variable using these same 0, 1 variables, or using a, a 0, 1 variable that's actually equivalent. You want to recognize that. Because you're going to put the yijs into a relaxation, perhaps. You want to make sure that equivalent yijs are recognized as equivalent, otherwise the relaxation is too weak. Okay, another uh, situation is in constraint programming. You may want to model the problem using two different variable systems, which is very common. So for example, you may have one set of variables indicating the job to which you assign a worker, and vice versa. And some of the constraints may be expressed in terms of the x's and some in terms of the y's. So you want to indicate channeling constraints in the model to connect the variables. Okay. Uh, this can be done automatically. And the channeling constraints can get quite complicated in sophisticated modeling situations. So we want to automate that process as well. Uh, another issue, very often uh, you want to model the problem as a disjunction of a linear system. In fact, mixed integer modeling is equivalent to modeling a problem as a disjunction of linear systems. It's exactly the same as a theorem of modeling for, for mixed integer programming. This is a very fundamental type of modeling structure, disjunctions of linear systems. Well, usually disjunctions of linear systems are handled in mixed integer solvers by this uh, convex solve formulation. You introduce mu zero one variables, you introduce some mu continuous variables that disaggregate the original variables like so, and you formulate the disjunction like this. Okay. So you have mu variables being introduced. Okay. And these y, yk is one when the kth disjunct here is true, is satisfied. Well, you may have another disjunction of linear systems that has the same set of alternatives. So that when the kth alternative here is true, you have another disjunction in which the kth alternative will be true as well, because they're based on the same set of alternatives. So you want to identify the y's that generate from this one with the y's that generate from other disjunctions that are based on the same set of alternatives. You want to do this automatically when the constraints are translated. Another very important instance of this type of idea is in nonlinear programming and global optimization. These, you know, all the state-of-the-art solvers use McCormick factorization okay, to deal with nonlinear constraints. A very simple example, suppose you have a bilinear term, xy, okay, in the model. Okay. This is dealt with by replacing the xy with a new variable z then the z is relaxed. So you generate these inequalities, uh, which are valid inequalities when z is equal to xy. So you replace xy with z. Okay. So in general, if you have a complicated nonlinear formula, certain subformulas of that formula are replaced with new variables. And then those new variables are used to formulate a linear relaxation of the constraint. Now, uh, in Nonlinear problems, you'll have a number of complicated nonlinear constraints. Each of those constraints will be disaggregated or broken down or analyzed into subformulas, maybe products, maybe quotients, maybe exponentials, 
okay? And so some of these subformulas will be replaced by new variables. Well, the same subformulas occur in several constraints, generally. So you want to replace them by the same variable in, in a systematic way. So all the, the big solvers you know, uh, have this issue. They have to deal with it one way or another. You know, so they coordinate the, exalt, the auxiliary variables introduced by McCormick factorization. So we want to automate this process too. Uh, another avenue that would generate new variables might be the reformulation of global constraints. Perhaps you have a global constraint like cumulative scheduling, whatever, all diff. You want to reformulate it as a mixed integer constraint set. Uh, very often you introduce new variables to do this. So for example, maybe you have a sequence constraint and a cardinality constraint in your uh, CP model. So the, the sequence constraint limits the number of jobs of a certain type that can occur in a given time interval where xi is the job in position i in the sequence. Okay? And cardinality limits uh, how many times a given job appears. Okay. Well, uh, maybe when you formulate these two, reformulate these two constraints using a MIP solver, zero, you know, mixed integer solver, you'll introduce zero one variables to indicate that job i occurs in position j for the end, the end position i. Well, the new zero one variable introduced here will be the same one as one introduced here when you unpack these two constraints. You want to recognize that fact. And the same goes for uh, uh, mixed integer programming models. Now, this is not normally done in, in mixed integer solvers, but in principle, you could have global constraints uh, to represent typical mixed integer uh, you know, sub problems. For example, fixed charge network flow, lot sizing, and so forth. You could write a global constraint for fixed charge network flow, which would be automatically unpacked into a set of inequalities. And again, you will be introducing new variables there. So let me give you a motivating example of this. Uh, so here we, we have a little advertising problem. We have 10 advertising spots. And we want to allocate these spots to five products. Uh, we have a few constraints. At most, four spots can be allocated to a product. Uh, we don't want to spread our resources too thin, so uh, we're going to advertise at most three products and we're going to allocate at most four spots, at least four spots, to one of the products. So we can focus on one of them. It's a little bit artificial, but I want to show you how to construct the model. Okay, so that's the problem. And the objective function is maximize profit, which profit is given by a table. If you allocate J spot to product I, then it contributes this much to uh, the profit. Okay, so let's model this. So I'm using a kind of generic modeling language here. Uh, so we start with the index sets, the spots, okay, the number of spots we allocate to a product and the five products. Okay, then we have some data, which is the objective function, okay, the table, profit. Now, this is the interesting part. Xi is the number of spots we're gonna allocate to product i. So it's declared like this. So what's going on here? The is makes it a variable declaration. It's a keyword. Okay. This is the semantic type of the variable. And that semantic type consists first of a keyword, how many, it could be how much, it could be when, there's a number of these that we use. How many of what? Spots. And then the key, the sort of the, the core of this is a predicate. So this is actually stands for a two-place two predicate that allocates spots to products. One of the terms of the predicate is given here. The other term is here. So the two terms of the predicate are spot and product. Every variable is going to be associated with a predicate in this way. Here's the other term of the predicate. And the i is just the index straight. Then we're going to maximize the profit. Okay, and I'm using a, an indexed, variably indexed variable here. 
Down the constraints, the other kit spots available, that's easy. Okay. I'm putting the model up here as well. Uh, now, we're going to need a zero one variable to model this problem. So we're going to let yij be one when we assign j spots to product i. So this is how we declare. It's associated with the same predicate as before, the allocate predicate. These are the two terms of the predicate. Okay. But now we're interested in whether we're allocating j spots to product i. So we use the keyword whether. Right. That makes it a zero, one variable with the same predicate. Now we can write down the other constraints in a straightforward way using the zero, one variable. Okay, now what happens? Well, you have to associate the y with dx in the obvious way. So this is what these two constraints do. This is generated by the solver. Uh, the y is the sum of the one, the sign of the constraint, and then dx is defined in terms of the y in the obvious way. So this is, these are linking constraints generated by the solver based on the fact that both of these two variables are associated with the same predicate, but in a different way. One is a how many, one is a weather. So it looked at the how many, looked at the weather, looked at the fact that it's the same predicate, and deduces from that how to relate the two. Okay. Now, how about the objective function? Well, we have to do something with this, so we're going to linearize it in the way it's usually done in MIPS solvers, okay, by introducing a zero, one variable y prime. This is the obvious thing. Well, this y prime is really the same as the y we've already introduced. Okay, it's one when we allocate j spots to product i. We have to recognize that. The way we recognize it is the solver, when it generates this, will give it a semantic type. It'll give it the same type because it has the same meaning as the other y, as whether we allocate product j spots to product i. So since the two will have the same type, they're the same variable. There's a unique type for every variable. All right. So now this predicate, you can think of as denoting a relation, a set of couples. Okay. Now, there's a, a few properties you have to observe in this relation. Since this term of the relation is a variable, it must be a function of the other column. Not just a relation, but a function. Okay. And this is how the two uh, declarations look. So what we do is to regard this how many and this whether as querying the relation. It's asking the relation how many spots are allocated to I. We'll take a look down the list of rows and see how many. Or whether. This, it's a, this is a projection. On the relation. Okay. So the keyword is like a database query. The database consists of relations denoted by the predicates which are associated with the variables. Okay. That's the idea. All right. So I'm going to show you some more examples of this and you can see what you think and you know, how this works. Now, the, one, the nice thing about this relation table. You can read off the channeling constraints. Just read them off like that to relate the two variables. These are, should be very familiar to constraint programming guys in the audience. If you have uh, several jobs to be assigned to the same worker, okay then you use a set value variable and a which set a uh, declaration. And the channeling constraint looks like this. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now, has this been done before? Well, uh, semantic typing has been used before. In fact, it's, a, it's an old idea. It goes back to the uh, 1980s, 
So this is basically when object-oriented programming became really hot in the 1980s. So it inspired object-oriented modeling. There's an old paper that uses semantic types. Uh, there's a very interesting paper by these guys, Barry Lechenbrough and Krishnan, which is one of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon, uh, which tries to analyze conditions under which you can identify variables based on their semantic types. That's actually a very hard problem. It's a problem in philosophy. So Kimbrough actually has a PhD in philosophy. He's the only guy in OR, as far as I know, other than me, who has a PhD in philosophy. Okay. There are two of us in the world, <laughs> for better or for worse. So he, he uh, researched some medieval philosophy and dug up this concept of quiddity, which comes out of the 12th century logic. And they tried to analyze this problem. And they basically concluded you can't do it. You can't, you know, in, in a fail-safe way, identify variables based on the semantic types in general. And there's some strongly typed languages around. These are quite old, but they're around. They have never really caught on, but they're out, they're out there. Now, we're doing a little bit different, okay? We're less ambitious than these guys because they were, they were working on a model management problem. So in other words, if you have a model here, you have another model there, you know, some of the variables in these two models will be the same. You want to identify that. That's a really a hard problem. That requires understanding the quiddity of the uh, semantic types. Okay? That problem has never been solved. Okay? And we're not going to do that. We're not going to try to match up the variables in two different models. That's too hard. We're going to suppose there's one model. Okay, and the user is going to be careful always to give different variables different declarations in this one model. Then we're going to try to deal with the new variables that are created by the, uh, the unpacking of the global constraints. So this is how we are more ambitious. We are uh, we're looking at new variables, and we're also doing more than simply identifying variables. We are we're, uh, detecting other kinds of relationships like the channeling constraints I showed you. Okay. Uh, there's also a lot of modeling systems that, to some extent, convey structure to the solver. Here's two of them that do. So we want to make this thoroughgoing feature of the modeling language. The predicates and the keywords tell the solver the structure of the constraints. So the solver can exploit that by generating the right cutting planes, the right filtering algorithms, you know, the right branching strategy based on that problem structure. <clears throat> this is the one that we did. So, none of these systems actually solve the variable management problem I described, to my knowledge. Uh, another very simple example, which I think, this is the example that actually got me started years ago when I was writing a book on this stuff. Okay. I didn't know how to deal with this example. Okay. So we have an assignment problem, elementary assignment problem. We're going to assign jobs to workers. Okay, so XI is which job you assign worker I. Okay, we're going to minimize the assignment cost. Then we can use an all diff constraint to model this problem. Now we're going to unpack this using uh, zero one variables because it's a simple assignment problem. Right? Assignment problems expressed in terms of zero one variables are totally unimodular, so they're very easy to solve this linear programming problem. So we want to rewrite this assignment problem as a zero one assignment problem. Right? Solve it very easily. Okay, to do that, you have to introduce zero one variables, and you formulate the objective function like this. And this is a declaration of the zero one variable. The all diff constraint, again, you want to formulate using zero one variables using assignment constraints, the classical assignment constraints you see in all the textbooks. Okay. Well, these two zero one variables are the same variable, They're the same. But maybe this, the solver doesn't know that because one is introduced by the objective function and one is introduced by the constraint. 
the object constraint here, the object constraint. So, you know, years ago I asked myself, you know, how can we deal with this problem? In other words, we have to take a global view of the model, even though we're processing the global constraints one at a time. We want to take a global view and match up these variables when they're related. How can we do this? So that's how I got started. And the way you do it is to note that these two variables have the same semantic type. They're associated with the same predicate, and they have the same query, because they're the same variable. Uh, a few more examples. Okay, Latin square problem. We want all the rows and columns to have distinct numbers. Okay, now we're going to formulate this uh, in a redundant way. We're going to write down three formulations that you can do in constraint programming. So we have three sets of variables, which number to assign to row i, column j, which column to assign row i, number j, and so forth. Right? So there's three variable systems you can use. And for each variable system, you have a different set of all different constraints to model the problem. Okay, so it's redundant modeling, and we hope that this redundant modeling will help with the propagation, you know, stronger propagation. Okay. But we have to relate these three variables with channeling constraints. Okay. These are the, the, the constraints here. Uh, well, this is the relation. All the three variables are, are connected with the same predicate the assigned predicate, which has three terms. Well, if you look at this table, you can read off the channeling constraints. Okay, here they are. It's a little bit complicated, but this is, this is what they are. This relates the, var the variables to each other. This relates the x and the y and the z here. You need all three of these as possible channeling. So this is done automatically just by looking at the, the fact that we have three switches associated with the same predicate. So you get three mixed integer models based on the three variable systems. And the system will be able to identify the zero one variables in these three models and in real life they're really the same model. Okay, so, so if you convert this sort of redundant CP model to a MIP model, you're gonna get one MIP model because the translations are really the same. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, suppose you have a lot of these switch variables associated with the same predicate. Is there a general pattern or connecting the variables with channeling? This is the pattern. Okay, so here we have a, a predicate in which the first k terms are which variables, that's its job to assign the worker or whatever, and the rest are some other have some other terms. Okay. The channeling constraint look like this. You know, they're rather mind-boggling, they're very tedious. Give you eye strain. But that's what it looks like. But you can just read it off from the table. This is quite general. If you have, you can have several weather variables as well. So I mentioned the weather, in fact, is a projection operator. So suppose that we have a, a variable that indicates uh, whether we're assigning worker I to job J on day B. That would be a zero one variable here. Well, we'd like to know whether worker I is assigned to job J on any day. That's a projection, you project out the day. So you just define it, you declare it like this, for different weather. The system knows what to do. Or you want to perhaps ask whether uh, worker I is assigned to any job on any day. So you project out both the day and the job, and you get this answer. So the system notices they are all associated with the same predicate. So you have a weather, okay, and some of the terms are omitted, indicating the projection you want. Now, uh, an interesting little uh, syntactic detail. I sort of like this. Here. Suppose we just have a very simple variable. Xi is the cost of activity i. How are you going to declare that using a predicate? Well, this is how we do it. We, we just have this cost activity i predicate. 
Okay, so it's a one place predicate. Formally, what's going on is this. This is what you're saying, how much cost associated with a cost predicate whose terms are cost and activity i. Okay, so formally you have to do it this way to make everything consistent. But we just have a shorthand. And even more extreme example, suppose x is just cost with no index. Formally, you have to define it like this. It's the, it's the pattern I described. You have to have a predicate, a new predicate cost with no arguments except for this other term we also call cost. So we have a, an abbreviated form. Okay. So there's a little nicety there, but it's sort of cute, I thought. So you can have these short forms with simple, simple cases. But here's the thing associated with the predicate. Okay. Piecewise linear. Okay. Very important uh, type of thing. Okay. So we have a piecewise global constraint. Okay. By the way, you know, mixed integer programmers use piecewise linear functions all the time. And they break these down into uh, zero one models. Okay. Which, is, by the way, is not the best way to do it. But they do it that way. Okay. So, so let's suppose we're going to break this down into a zero one model like the MIP programmers do. What it looks like. Messy thing. This requires new variables. This is how we declare the new variables. To do so, we have to inherit uh, a new predicate from two of the original terms. We have an output predicate, which is x, and then we have the, the breakpoints, a, which is a a data set here, an array of breakpoints on here on the x-axis. So we create a new predicate that inherits those two objects. We put them together. This is done by the system. And the x bar is how much cost occurs in a in the i interval of, of this uh, piecewise linear function. And delta is the last one that has a positive. So the standard, you know, standard idea for interpreting a piecewise linear. Now suppose we have another function that's piecewise linear that has the same breakpoints, like this f prime has the same breakpoints. So you want to recognize the fact it has the same breakpoints. Well, uh, the solver creates another zero one model for the new function. Okay with new variables, 0, 1, and continuous variables. Well, they're really the same as the original variable. Uh, so, sorry. It's the same. So it has the same declaration. So it's going to identify this x prime and delta prime with the original x and delta for the first piecewise linear. So it knows how to relate multiple piecewise linear uh, functions that have the same breakpoint. That gives you a tight relaxation. Okay. Uh, some solvers now are using integral variables, particularly for temporal reasoning. So, for example, over the OPL Studio guys have, uh, have a, a major role for integral valued variables. Uh, we can do that too. So, it looks something like this you have a when keyword. So, the uh, job J is going to be scheduled within a certain interval. It's the processing interval for that job. So xj is the interval within which job j runs. So the predicate we associate with is a scheduling predicate. Job j is assigned to interval running. It has to be within some time window. Then we have cumulative constraints just to make sure we don't uh, exceed the resources available. So it's a standard cumulative scheduling problem in this type of program. This is how the declaration looks. This makes it the integral variable here. This uh, time is the, the time horizon. This is what the zero one model looks like for cumulative scheduling. By the way, MIP solvers are really quite good at cumulative scheduling nowadays. It's hard to beat them. 
this, this is the model that I use. Very simple model. We in, you introduce two new variables, two zero one one variables. Uh, one indicating uh, when the job starts, and one indicating whether the job is running at a particular time. So you need those two zero set to zero one variables to model the problem. Now, so far so good, but suppose we want to add another constraint. We want to make sure that the finish times of the jobs are separated by a certain amount of time. You know, for example, we may have to unload the machines. We have one crew that unloads the machines, so we don't want two jobs and different machines you know, finishing up at the same time. So we can't unload them at once. So we have a, we have a constraint that looks like this that says that the end time has to be, you know, it has to be separated by a certain amount from zero. So this introduces some, some new variables that you encoded in a zero one manner. It looks something like this. You know, epsilon variable. It indicates whether the end of the job is at time t. Okay. Now the the catch is, this is a little bit subtle, so I'm, I'm not going to try to explain it completely, but these, these variables, the epsilon I just introduced in the original 0, 1 variables are related by an offset because the, the delta jt indicates whether the job starts at time t, and the epsilon indicates whether it ends at time, some time t. So the start time and the end time are obviously related because we know the duration of the job. So we want to encode this relationship somehow in the model. We'll do it automatically. Well, actually, you can do it because you have these three declarations. They're all associated with the same predicate. They have different keywords. They're a little bit different. There's some inheritance going on here. Uh, and the solver deduces this relationship based on these declarations. There's also another relationship you can deduce. It's actually redundant but it may be useful in the relaxation. And finally, uh, a traveling salesman problem. I really like this example. I think this is my last example. Uh, so we have a traveling salesman problem with a couple, with a couple extra constraints. Okay. So uh, we have a set of cities. We have a distance between cities. Now, we also, uh, want to say that certain cities have to precede other cities in the tour, the traveling salesman tour. Okay, so we want to go to Adelaide before we go to Melbourne. Maybe not immediately before, but at some point before. So we have precedence constraints, like so. And we have some links missing from the network. You can't go directly from Perth to Melbourne, perhaps. So we can take that link out. Okay, so we have a list here of all the links that, uh, that emanate from City J. Some, some will be missing. Okay, so we have those two side constraints. We want to handle that somehow. So to model this problem, we need two perspectives on the problem, two variable systems. So one is the position in which City J, City I is ordered. It is fifth in the sequence in the tour, whatever. You also need a traveling salesman type variable that people use in OR, and that is the successor, the next city after city I. Okay, so those are very different type of variables, which are related, but very different. Okay. okay, so we have, we can use the X variable to express the precedence constraints. Right, so if I has to come before J, then the position of I is less than or equal to the position, less than the position of J. So it's very, very good for expressing precedence constraints. However, the missing arc constraints cannot be written with these X variables. You need the S variables, the successor variables. And, well, they're implicit in the domain of the successor variable, of the S variable. So that enforces the successor missing link constraint. Uh, now we have a, 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 
an objective function, which is the usual one for traveling tail. Okay, I should say, did I forget to write down the, uh, we have an all diff and a circuit. I didn't write that down, did I? I think I left a slide out. So the two constraints of the, pro of the problem are all diff for the x's. I should say all diff x. Those the these all have to have different positions. And the circuit constraint required that the successor variables define a tour, a single tour. Okay, so we have a, an all diff constraint and a circuit constraint in the model. I think I deleted the slide by accident. So those are the constraints. Okay, now, what, what's the solver going to do with this? Well, it's going to look at the all diff and say, oh, I'm going to make that an assignment model, which is easy to solve, the all diff part, using a zero, one variable, whether it's in the i from position k. And it's declared like that. For the circuit, this language requires that we have a tour, okay, using this, the successor variables. I have a new zero, one variable, which indicates whether i immediately precedes j. These are the variables that the, the OR guys always use for traveling salesmen. Okay. Been using it for decades. They have all these nice cutting claims for the W variable. And it's defined like this. We see we use the same predicate with a different keyword. We have a, a successor keyword to indicate how it's related to the Z unit. Okay. A little detail. I won't worry about this. Now, the solver can, can process the circuit constraint by generating the cutting claims that we know from the literature in the zero, one variables. These are well known. Uh, Subtour elimination constraints, cone constraints, all of those things. You can also write cutting claims in terms of the, the, um, the, um, uh, the finite domain variable, if you want, the W stuff. And the keyword tells the solver how to relate these two systems of zero, zero one variables. Looks like that. So I think it's a nice example. So if you have this traveling salesman problem with two variable systems, which integer programming can't deal with, it doesn't want what that means. You can translate it into an integer programming model, which is very powerful for this problem. Uh, in a systematic way that relates the two variable systems correctly. Now, suppose that we want to add another constraint. We have constraints on which city is in position K. Okay, so I'm not talking about the position of city J in the sequence. I'm talking about which city is in position K. That's from just a dual perspective. Suppose we have a constraint that uses that type of variable, okay? So it's different from the other two variables that I'm using. We have a third system of variables here. How are we going to relate this third system of variables to the other? Well, the, the declaration is very simple. You just write this. You just say, which city in the ordering is in position K? So the other de declarations look like this, whether you know, weather ordering and originally, where is the like it was, which position the city is in, and the successor. Okay, so instead of saying which position, ordering city, now all we have to do is say which city, ordering position. And you get the dual perspective. Okay, so it's very simple to write this third variable system, and the solver knows exactly how to generate the channeling constraints for this. It's the same as the worker and job thing I showed you earlier. Now, once you do this, you can actually introduce a second objective function that's equivalent to the first one using these, these uh, position constraints, these position variables, I mean. Why? This allows you to write a second objective function that's equivalent, which can be very useful because you can look at the bounds on both objective functions at the same time. Perhaps one is tighter than the other. Okay, so to my knowledge, no one's ever done this in math programming, but we can do it now by introducing these new variables. 
Okay. So that's uh, my examples. So, so how does this stack up? What are the pros and the cons of semantic timing? Uh, by the way, I presented a talk something like this to uh, the Mixed Integer Programming Workshop, which occurs every summer, it's last year. And I had an audience full of skeptics. Okay, so I'll, I'll suggest that, you know, what some of their objections were. Well, my argument to them was, uh, well, first of all, we're conveying structure to the solver, because we have these meta constraints, global constraints, that's good. Okay. We can incorporate the state of the art throughput. You know, we know the best filtering methods for this constraint. We know the best cutting planes. Okay. So we, the entire literature is incorporated in the uh, interpreter for the model. Uh, it allows the solver to use, you know, techniques from both sides of the fence, both from integer programming and from constraint programming, uh, at the same time. And it's a self-documenting model. You can catch bugs because you have these unique declarations for each variable. The cons, we talked about this yesterday, okay, well, you have to be familiar with a large library of meta modeling constraints. Now, constraint programmers are accustomed to this. You know, they don't seem to object to it. But I can tell you that the mixed integer programming community is allergic to this idea. And perhaps the SAP community too. Okay? They just don't want to have to go to a you know a dictionary and choose a high level constraint. They want to write the problem using atomistic inequalities. Very low level. This is the way we're brought up in OR. You know, we learned this at our mother's knee. You know, always break a problem down into little inequalities. Very hard habit to break. We get a lot of resistance you know, to this idea. Uh, what's my response? Okay, one response is that when you model the problem, you're already thinking at high level. Okay, you have a network flow situation. So you arrive at network you know, flow conservation you already know it's a network flow. You just don't tell the solver about it. You know, so you break it down into conservation constraints. And then the solver has to look at this and figure out, oh, that's a network flow. Now, actually, the MIP solvers can do that for network flow in a couple of other situations, but not many. So why keep it a secret from the solver you know, what the structure of the problem is? Why don't just write the problem using the structural components you already have in mind? So the way that we learn to model in my background, in the OR background. We learned the model by learning how to write down a pretty sharp network flow, how to write down capital budgeting. Right? We already have these concepts in our head. And then we break them down into, into small atomistic constraint sets. So actually, we're already familiar. And this is true in any domain, in any field. Right? You have a certain library of concepts you learn as you learn the field. Okay? Uh, maybe two or three hundred of these. So you may as well just use those concepts when you write a model. Um, okay. And besides, by giving names to all these modeling concepts, we can think about them more precisely. Right now, we don't really have you know, well understood you know, uh, taxonomy for, for modeling concepts. Now, the argument against it is that we have already you know, heavily typed languages out there that people don't use because they are stuck in this uh, traditional way of modeling. So how are we going to change that? The next generation, perhaps. Okay, to sort of start over with the next generation. I don't know. <clears throat> so those are my responses to the uh, mixed integer programming audience. I don't think they were convinced, but perhaps you're convinced. So that's what I have to say, uh, and I welcome your your reaction. Yeah? Yes. Um, so in Minizing, um, we introduced, in addition to predicates, we introduced functions. Um, so the new version of Minizing with functions, and we presented that at, at CKR last year. Uh, and the idea there is, I think, um, 
closely related. I think it's not quite as powerful as, as this concept, but, but the idea is that as, as soon as you start modeling with functions, um, you can see syntactically that things are equal. Because if you have the same um, function call in different places, then, then you know they are equal. And the system recognizes those places. And, and um, for example, the, um, the benchmark we used uh, in, in the paper was exactly, I mean, not that we square, but it's a little, um, where you have overlapping right, yeah. all different constraints. And, um, and yeah, that, that seems to work very well. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, this seems to be a bit more powerful because you have this um, fully relational model where you, for example, with the, um, with the channeling constraints. But yeah. it'll be interesting to, to compare the two. Because I think the, the intention is exactly the same. So. Yeah, okay. So, uh, I guess it's a somewhat related question. Um, this model does seem more powerful, but how do you know when you've got enough keywords to capture all of the things that you're interested in? Do you, do you have any notion of completeness or any way of sort of argue, arguing completeness beyond the, well, I've looked at all the models of literature that seems to capture everything that I think is important? No, we don't. But I, I do think it's analogous to you know, the old relational database. There's a certain number of operators that people settled on, you know, for databases. But, but they did prove that they were sort of complete in some formal sense. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. So you have joins and projections and all of that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's something we haven't we haven't tried to do. Well, let me let me think about that. Yeah. So you know, so far it's just been ad hoc. Yeah. You know, we just meet. So for example, we have a which set. Operator, which you need sometimes. That wouldn't really occur in database concepts. I don't think people have done that in databases. Yeah, so it's a, it's a more difficult, it's a broader selection of keywords than you would see in databases. Yeah, so uh, we haven't thought about it. So that's an interesting uh, challenge. You know, trying to look at a completeness theorem or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where do your predicates come from? Yeah, the predicates are defined by the user. Okay, so the user has to learn it to think in terms of predicates. Yeah. So we think that's pretty natural because when you write indices on a variable, you're creating a predicate. Okay. You're relating the indices with a variable. You know. So that's where they come from. And if you come up with the wrong set of predicates, you don't get the recognition, and especially if they've got some overlap. Well, you have to know when two variables are related to the same predicate. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what's key. Yeah. yeah. That's so, that's very similar in in, in Minising, for example, where you if you have a function that, for example, gives you the zero one representation of an integer, but well, if you don't use that function, obviously you don't you don't get the the equality system. Yeah. I've got a question from there. I don't know how to. Yes. Can you hear me now? More or less. Yes? Okay. Yeah, uh, I can hear you now. Uh, hi, John. Thanks for a great talk. So I wanted to ask, uh, a lot of the examples you gave, uh, it was really clear to me the benefits if you're going to encode these models into MIP, you know, how you could very cleanly link up all the right variables and not replicate them. But uh, I was curious, do you think in the CP context that um, these kind of semantic uh, expressions are really helpful? I'm, from my perspective of the examples you gave, uh, just writing the channeling constraint between the variables is fairly lightweight when you're in CP, maybe not when you're in MIP. Yeah, so we have thought about that too. So right now, the advantage we're offering to CP is an automatic formulation of channeling constraints. You're suggesting, well, a CP modeler already knows how to do that. Yeah, yeah, no, you don't think so. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I've taught a lot of <laughs> new CP programmers, and it's not obvious to them how to do channeling. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so CP, normally you don't introduce new variables. Uh, however, a SAT encoding, which we haven't really explored yet, does introduce new variables. So uh, you know, at least if you consider that a branch of CP, maybe we could have, you know be, be useful to SAT encoders, to SAT modelers. Yeah. 
so I, I had a question. At, at the beginning, the claim was that the, uh, the system can not only uh, detect equivalents between variables, but other uh, relations. Do you have an example of another relation, an equivalent? Yeah, so one of the relations was the, all, all of the channeling constraints are relations that are captured by the semantic typing. And uh, the conversion from integer to zero of one variable, as I mentioned, is another one. Um, so those are the main ones that we have, we have used. The temporal variables, where we found the offset between the beginning and the end of the job, that was another relation we deduced. So I think as, as we introduce new queries, you know, we look at how it relates to the existing queries and think about what kind of relations they imply. So I think that's fairly straightforward. Like if you have a set of keywords and queries, you can just ask for every pair of keywords, what is the relationship in, of variables that they are, that, that these relationships imply? And we just, uh, just do that. So you can get quite a few eventually. Uh -huh. uh, one question here. So if you have predicates over many indices, I guess I could potentially introduce many new channeling, channeling constraints and new variables. So is there, is there a way or have you thought about adding those constraints dynamically uh, sort of on the fly when they are needed or when those are violated? Well, that would be up to the solver. You know, so at least the modeling language would tell the solver uh, what's available in the way of channeling constraints to add dynamically. Right. And that's as far as we go. And the solver decides when they're needed, when they're generated. So one more question. So you, you take the model and you can generate various um, um, Strategies. So, so you, you, you can have your network flow, you can have your whatever, lot sizing. If you pull those all together, do you actually get the benefit of the direct, of the single um, structure there, or do they interfere with each other? Okay, so let me think about this. Um, Okay, okay, formulating a relaxation for a MIP model is a complicated, a complicated process. So at least what we're doing here is to uh, is to identify and relate variables, you know, that are, that are related in the relaxation. So there's no interference. Yeah, you know, there's no interference there. I don't think you can't say that. So basically, what you want in a relaxation is as many valid constraints as you can think of. Okay. So we don't have interference. Just the issue is whether we're adding all the valid constraints that should be added. So I think that we do add the constraints that follow from identifying and relating variables that are related to each other. We don't add valid inequalities that can be deduced from multiple constraints. You know, so perhaps you know, someone trained in polyhedral theory can look at these global constraints and say, well, you know, we can use uh, you know, flow cuts here. And you guys didn't deduce that. Okay. We can't do that yet. Okay, we're not sure how to, how to approach that issue. Give a global perspective for you know tighter polyhedral cuts. Yeah. We're just focusing on the variable identification yeah. relationships so far. But there's no interference. No. Yeah. They, 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 you know, it's just a matter of identifying as many valid constraints as you can from this set of global global constraints. And adding too many isn't a disadvantage. It's not going to slow things down. Okay. Uh, from all the textbooks, all the textbooks would tell you you can't have too many valid constraints in a relaxation. Uh, in fact, you can. You know, experimentally, we know that sometimes adding valid cuts actually slows it down. Okay, that's a subtle point. We don't really understand why. We have a notion about why. So yeah, having too many can slow it down, but none of the solvers deal with that problem. So there's nothing. The state of the art MIP solvers generate too many cuts. They just generate all they can think of. And sometimes it's too many. It's, it has to do with the shape of the polytope and all of that. All right. No more questions from anywhere? <laughs> all, 
All clear? Right. Thanks very much indeed, John. Okay.